Okay, thank you. Well, Rick was talking about brains, but you know they have all these amazing organ transplants going on where they can transplant all these different organs. The new technology is going to be brain transplants. However, it's a different price depending what brain you want. So if you want a brain like Einstein's, you've got to pay a real premium price. But the most expensive brain of all is going to be a mountain guide's brain because it's never been used. Okay, sorry. <laughs> all right. Brain transplants aren't going to so got you all excited. They are able to do, however, is transplant parts of the brain. So if you get a damaged part of your brain, they can take a piece uh, from a cadaver or someone who uh, rode a motorcycle and got an accident. But there's only certain parts of the brain where that works. So, well, it's basically parts of the brain that govern muscle control. Uh, they can do that. So, well, also there's they're thinking that. Like for some people, the uh, part of the brain that governs emotions get damaged, they might be able to fix that. So yeah, they don't know how far they can go with it, but obviously uh, they're not going to be able to restore your spirit or, you know, they're not going to be able to hear your memory is something that they can't fix, so that's the way it goes. Okay, pillars of Christianity. If you ever watched uh, the... DVD of my debate with uh, the British chemist Peter Atkins. Uh, at one point, the moderator asked me, okay, can you name three possible conceivable scientific discoveries that would cause you to abandon Christianity and become an atheist? And uh, these are the three I named. If we could prove that the universe didn't have a beginning, that would be catastrophic to the Christian faith. There'd be no creator. If we could prove that we human beings are not exceptional, we're just like all the rest of life on planet Earth, that would be catastrophic to the Christian faith. And if we could prove that Jesus did not rise body from the dead, as Paul says in Corinthians, that too would be catastrophic to the Christian faith. But in the debate, I made the point, evidence for these three is proof that Christianity is true. It cuts both ways. If you can prove that this is false, that's the end of Christianity. If you can prove this is true, and that's proof that Christianity indeed is true and the God of the Bible exists. Well, today I want to focus on number one. We human beings truly exceptional. And with human exceptionalism, there's three main biblical points. Number one, that humans are the product of special creation. We didn't come from some evolutionary ancestry. God created Adam and Eve. He specially created them. Miraculously created them. And we're all descended from man and that woman. And as it tells us in the Bible, humans alone amongst all life on planet Earth are created in the image of God. Now, there's a lot of debate about what this image of God means, but at a minimum, it means that like God has a spirit, we have a spirit. As God creates, we create. In fact, when my colleague Fazal Rana comes to speak to you, what he's going to be sharing with you is that what we see inside the cell, we see all these amazing machines. We actually see every machine that we human beings have built, basically making the point that when we design, when we create, we follow the pattern of God in designing and creating. But here's the difference. We can find a piston engine inside the cell. It looks just like the piston engines in your cars. The only difference is the piston engines inside the cell are twice as efficient as the piston engines in your car. Likewise, you can find a rotary engine. The big difference is the rotary engines inside the cell are, have a superior design and a superior efficiency. It's like that all the way across. Basically making a point, yes, we design like God does, we create like God does, that's part of the image of God, but we fall far short of what God can do. And humans alone ask the God question and have the capacity to relate to God. As I mentioned uh, two nights ago at the church in the evening, is that these birds and mammals uh, ask questions about us. And so they can relate to us, a higher species, but they're not able to relate to God. Only we human beings are capable of relating to God. 
And when we study uh, the artifacts that we see associated with Neanderthals, the Denisovans, with Homo erectus, we can't find any evidence they were capable of asking the God question, acknowledging the, the existence of God, relating to God. Now, we've written a 400-page book on human origins. So if you want to go into this in much more depth, you can get this book, Who is Adam? You can get a free chapter at reasons.org slash Rana. That's the last name of my colleague. And you'll also find several chapters in this book that I wrote, Hidden Joe. But the real question, this is a raging debate on conservative seminary campuses today. Are we humans the product of common descent? In other words, are we human beings and the Neanderthals and the chimpanzees naturally descended from a common ancestor? So the story kind of goes like this. You got this primitive ancient uh, creature over here that step by step evolves. Now, when I'm in Japan, I put a sumo wrestler there. When I'm in Canada, I put a hockey player. Whatever sports bias you want, uh, you can stick, stick in there, okay? Uh, but I'm actually an editor for a peer-reviewed journal issue on human exceptionalism. So I'm recruiting uh, Christian or scientists uh, to write for that journal. But these are some of the topics I'm encouraging to write on. With respect to human exceptionalism, humans alone express and use complex symbols. I mean, you really don't see dogs or cats or Neanderthals uh, you know, meditating over Schrodinger's wave equation of chemistry. That just doesn't happen. They don't know F equals MA, even the simplest of the equations. Humans alone, we actually invent symbols for numbers and we can use those. Sentences and an alphabet. So we alone are capable of developing an alphabet, actually using it, a number system. Uh, humans alone invent and manufacture complex tools. Now you'll see a lot in the anthropological literature about the amazing tools that these bipedal primates built before us. But what you'll notice is they're all composed of one stone or one piece of wood. What you don't see them doing is linking a piece of wood uh, with sinews uh, to an axe head and making an axe out of it. You don't see a bow and arrow. Uh, what you see is either a spear uh, or you see a stone. And actually, if you compare the most advanced tools by the Neanderthals with what you see uh, by the chimpanzees, we really can't tell the difference. Chimpanzees use spears just like the Neanderthals use spears. They also will chip away rocks to crack open uh, nuts, just like the Neanderthals do. Now, you could argue that the Neanderthals are a little bit better at uh, selecting the right kinds of wood for spears, because the spears that chimpanzees use are only about this long, whereas the Neanderthals use spears that are about that long. On the other hand, they're hunting different kinds of animals. The spears that are about that long uh, are actually ideal for the bush babies uh, that the chimpanzees hunt, whereas the longer outer spears are ideal uh, for hunting deer and other large animals. This is significant because I could name you one very famous theologian who basically makes the point Heidelbergensis must be as intelligent as we are today. It's a creature that lived 750,000 to a million years ago. And the reason why this famous theologian is convinced that Adam had to be a Heidelbergensis, as they said, we've actually found a spear uh, that dates back uh, three quarters of a million years ago that has all the characteristics of a javelin, an Olympic javelin. And they said, hey, uh, for a carefully made Olympic javelin, means they must have the intelligence and the capability we have. But notice, still a single piece of wood. And Heidelbergensis and Neanderthals, they'd be experimenting with different kinds of woods. We see this with the chimpanzees. They'll break off pieces of wood, they try them, and eventually they figure, wow, this piece works a lot better than the other piece. So it's not at all surprising that we find a spear dating back half a million years that has characteristics that resemble. And that's important. It's not exactly like an Olympic javelin. It resembles an Olympic javelin. But since they're using it for hunting purposes, that's not at all surprising. But again, it's not a bow and arrow. 
Uh, it's not an axe. It's a single piece of wood. So we single pieces of wood or we see rocks. Number four, humans explosively advance technology. What we see with the Neanderthals, they date from a quarter of a century ago to 45,000 years ago. The tool technology they had a quarter of a million years ago is the same as the tool technology they had 45,000 years ago. There's no advance. Whereas look at us human beings. In the space of a thousand years, uh, we've gone from simple tools to putting men on the moon and sending spacecraft uh, to all the planets in our solar system. And uh, even when you look back uh, 35,000 years ago, we see that humans uh, were able to actually develop a sophisticated bakery industry. So rapid technological advance, humans alone manufacture and wear clothes. And so what we see with the earliest humans, they're actually living in a climate zone that's 15 degrees centigrade colder than what Neanderthals are able to live in. And if you take a naked Neanderthal and compare with a naked human being, the naked human being needs to be in a climate zone 10 degrees centigrade warmer than the Neanderthal. You know, we're tall, we're slim, we have very little body hair, uh, so uh, we need to be in a warm climate. The only way we can survive in a cold climate, wear lots of clothes. Yes? I'm sorry, what is a Neanderthal? Oh, we don't know what a Neanderthal is. Okay. I should show you a picture of a Neanderthal. Uh, there's a lot of debate going on in theological circles where they're claiming that humans and Neanderthals interbred and that, uh, you know, Europeans have more Neanderthal DNA in them uh, than what we see in Sub-Saharan Africans. Uh, we have both young earth creationists and theistic evolutionists uh, declaring that Neanderthals are fully human, just like us. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about that because uh, the literature now is saying they are morphologically distinct. One thing I can share with you is that um, uh, they weren't quite as tall as we were. They were heavier than we were. So they were heavier than us, more muscular than us. They had a barrel-shaped body. They had short arms and short legs. All that helps them to retain body heat. And so they had more hair than we had, and they had an enormous nasal capacity. And you need a big nasal capacity to warm up cold air so it doesn't damage your lungs when you're in a cold climate. Now, how we humans adapt to that, we wear a parka. And a parka basically does the same thing as a huge nasal capacity. But Neanderthals, in proportion to the size of their skull, have by far the biggest nasal capacity of any mammal that ever existed. So they're an ancient animal? They're an, okay. They're in a category we call bipedal primates, which means they predominantly walk on two legs, as opposed to chimpanzees and orangutans that walk on all fours. Chimpanzees can walk, say if a chimpanzee has an injured arm, it'll walk on two legs. But it can't walk as well as we do. We humans are referred to as a compulsory bipedal. We can't walk on all fours. We have to walk on two legs. Neanderthals are also compulsory bipedal. Uh, they, they're not able to move around on all fours. They have to be bipedal like we are. Uh, so we're talking primates, we're talking bipedalism, and we're talking brain sizes, all, typically, but not always, larger than that of a chimpanzee. For a comparison, the chimpanzee brain is one quarter the size of a human brain. Now, Neanderthals have a brain as big as ours, but the encephalization ratio is not as big as ours. What does that mean? The weight of the brain compared to the average weight of the body. That's where we, we're way ahead of the Neanderthals, but because they have a bigger body size, for example, whales have a bigger brain than we do but the brain has got to support a much larger body. So, okay, any other questions before we move on? Yes? So where does, where does that fit in from like Adam to where we are now? Well, again, this is a major theological debate. I just got back from a conference on this where you've got conservative theologians basically saying, I think we have to push Adam back three quarters of a million years to a million years, mainly because they're persuaded by this uh, uh, Heidelbergensis javelin, you know, half a million years ago, and uh, they think, hey, this is just like an Olympic javelin. They have to be just as intelligent as we are. But again, it's a single piece of wood, 
and if you read the literature, it resembles an Olympic javelin. It's actually significantly decayed. I've looked at the javelin, and it looked, to me, it looks nothing like an Olympic javelin. It's approximately the same length, approximately the same weight, but it's got a bend in it. So it's, in my opinion, it doesn't quite rank. And again, it's just one piece of wood. So, and you've already heard from me, where I put Adam is during the last ice age, based on Genesis chapter two. God created Adam and Eve when four known rivers came together and the place where they come together uh, is in the southeastern part of the Persian Gulf, uh, which means we're looking at sometime during the last ice age when the sea levels were 390 feet lower. That would make it dry ground. So, uh, and that would put you in a range of 15,000 to 120,000 years ago. Uh, carbon dating would mean that it would be 40,000 to 120,000 years ago. And where you can get a little more precision, the earliest artifacts we see for humans are in the Persian Gulf in East Africa. And there were three times when there was a very easy migration route from the Persian Gulf into East Africa, 52,000 years ago, 77,000 years ago, and 115,000 years ago. But that's the best we can do. People asking what's the best scientific date? Well, based on mitochondrial DNA, the best scientific date we got for the origin of humans is 150,000 plus or minus 150,000 years ago. But if you read the online articles, they'll say 300,000 years ago because they push it all the way to the edge of the air bar. But the truth is it's 150 plus or minus 150. So the biblical date is actually more accurate than our best scientific date. Between 45,000 years ago and 300,000 years ago, we do not have any radiometric dating tools. All you got are things like thermoluminescence, optical luminescence, which are notoriously unreliable. Okay, moving on. Manufactures and wears clothes, invents and uses complex languages. I mean, several of you here actually know more than one language. Some of you who are computer buffs know five or six computer languages. We humans can easily uh, very quickly develop multiple complex languages. We form complex social structures, which means we're not only a member of a family, we become member of a tribe, we become member of a village, we become member of a province, we become member of a nation, we become a member of the world. Whereas what we see with animals, they just have one social grouping, they don't have tiered social groupings like we human beings do. We also see this with the Neanderthals. It's basically just family groups. And the humans invent and use complex trading and transportation systems. We alone uh, build boats, uh, build carts. Uh, basically, uh, we alone also will uh, tame horses and donkeys and use them for transportation systems. Humans alone engage in mathematics, literature, philosophy, and theology. Uh, we domesticate and train the nephesh animals. They don't domesticate us. They don't tame us. We tame them. And we look at the Neanderthals and the Denisovans. We see no evidence that any capacity to train or tame any of the animals. We cultivate and breed crops. Humans were doing that immediately. They control fire for heating and manufacturing. They process and cook food, bread making I mentioned. They build complex homes and structures. There's a major debate in the scientific literature where people are claiming they've got evidence that Neanderthals had control over fire. <coughs> However, all we've been able to document is their control of fire is no different from what we see in chimpanzees. Chimpanzees will opportunistically take advantage of wildfires. So they see a wildfire, what they do is up all the nuts that they're not able to crack open with their stone tools and they throw the nuts on the wildfire they run away from the wildfire they wait till the wildfire is over they come back they harvest the nuts they crack them open and they have a feast we see the same kind of evidence for neanderthals and the real proof that neanderthals did not have control over fire the only place we see any correlation between the neanderthals and fire use is in the summertime we have none of it in the wintertime. 
if they had control over fire, you'd expect that they'd be using it in the winter a lot more frequently than they use it in the summer. Now, years ago, people were claiming that the Denisovans and Neanderthals and even Homo erectus were morphologically identical to us. There's been a flood of papers coming out in the anthropological literature that now soundly refute uh, that hypothesis. So some of the things we recognize is that humans, in terms of our brain, we alone have a globular skull shape. When you look at the great apes, uh, when you look at Neanderthals and all the bipedal primates that preceded us, they have an elongated brain. Humans have a globular brain. And that globular brain allows for a large parietal lobe. They say, what's the parietal lobe all about? That's where you do all your mathematics, your philosophy, your literature, your art, your music. It's all focused in the parietal lobe. When you pray, it's the parietal lobe that's making that happen. Humans alone have a large enough parietal lobe to support all those activities. Also, we're unique in our hand dexterity. So humans alone, for example, can carve a needle. Early humans were taking um, ivory and making a little hole in the library and making a needle. And humans alone can thread the needle. Uh, if you look at a chimpanzee, uh, they're just not able to thread a needle. Humans alone are capable of doing that. Humans alone have this amazing dexterity in their hands. A long infant uh, to adolescent development time. The longest development time that we see in the bipedal primates that preceded humans is about seven to eight years. Now, you might think the development time for humans is about 18 years. Actually, it's 25 years for men. It's 23 to 24 years for women. Now, the physical body uh, fully matures in about 20 years and a little bit faster for women. But in terms of the mental capabilities, uh, the brain function, it doesn't become fully mature for men until 25 and for women until about 23 or 24. And that may explain why you can't rent a car until you're 25. The car rental companies have already figured this out, uh, that the brain doesn't really mature to its full extent until you hit about 25 uh, for men, a little bit earlier uh, for women. And we have a high metabolic rate. Now, you think that that would be a big disadvantage for the survival of humans. We need to have consume a lot more food to maintain our body. And so our metabolic rate means that you know, we need to be consuming food all the time. The advantage we have is we're able to collect food far more efficiently than the apes can or the bipedal primates. And so yes, even though that our energy needs are much higher, uh, we are able to use less energy to get the food that we need. We have the longest lifespan. I mean, you know, about 80 years is the average uh, for today. Uh, what do you get with the uh, bipedal primates? And uh, about 40 years, an ape in, 40, in captivity can last as long as 40 years. In the wild, not quite so long. This just got published a week ago just got discovered that humans have an extreme food chewing efficiency advantage. Okay, uh, what we see per day, minutes a day. Now I've been watching you at meal times. I think for most of you, it's down around seven minutes a day. So, but that's part of it too, that the older people get the little more time they spend chewing their food. Uh, but you know what it is for the great apes and the bipedal primates that preceded us? They spend a minimum of four and a half hours chewing their food. And the maximum is about seven hours to chew their food. So they really can't do much. I mean, when you're chewing your food, that basically means you can't do other things. Because humans can take care of all their food consumption uh, exercises and chewing their food in seven to about an hour per day, that means we've got a lot more time uh, to gather food, to hunt food, to plant food, to harvest food than is the case with the apes uh, or the uh, hominids. So yeah, that's a discovery of just a week ago. 
I mentioned we have a high encephalization quotient, the weight of our brain compared to the rest of our body. And where the big difference is, is how much energy we devote to our brain. Now your brain is about three pounds, for some of us three and a quarter pounds, uh, but your typical human being, 35% of the calories you consume goes to the brain. So here's this thing that only weighs three and a three and a half pounds, but it takes or requires 35% of the total energy need. That's way beyond anything we see in any other mammal. Yes? Encephalization means the ratio of the weight of the brain to the weight of the body. So like if you're 150 pounds and your brain weighs, weighs three pounds, uh, your encephalization ratio uh, is three divided by 150. So uh, we have a slender skeletal frame, which means we can handle a hot climate. And with clothing, we can go into a warm climate. So unlike what we see the bipedal primates, where they were constrained to a small region of the world, humans can inhabit the whole world. And likewise, we have little body hair, which means we're able to go into warm climate zones. And uh, we have a very efficient cooling system. Of all the mammals on planet Earth, uh, we have the most efficient perspiration system. And because we don't have much hair, we're able to keep our bodies cool. We're slender, we're bipedal. By being bipedal, very little sunlight falls on our body. And so we have by far the best cooling system of any animal on the planet. I'm probably gonna skip over this because I think it's a bit too technical for many of you. And this is a, simply a slide showing that the gene expression of humans is radically what we see uh, for the Neanderthals or the Denisovans. This may be uh, uh, a slide that's a little easier for you to comprehend. And this is looking at the nucleotide differences uh, in the uh, DNA of humans. And so the average differences amongst all humans is only 30. So if we were to survey the 7.5 billion people on the planets, uh, there'd only be a differentiation in the nucleotides of just 30. But when we compare uh, the average human to Neanderthals, Neanderthals differ from us by 202. So you can see, because of this huge difference, anthropologists are now convinced Neanderthals are a distinct species. They're not human. They're completely distinct. Denisovans, we differ even more. Chimpanzees. And when you compare this 1462 to the 202, it actually rules out the possibility that Neanderthals <coughs> and chimpanzees have a common ancestor. So not only are we knocking out the model that humans have a common ancestor with the Neanderthals, we're knocking out the model that the Neanderthals have a common ancestor with the chimpanzees. Now back to the Neanderthals, because there's a lot of stuff in the literature. And incidentally, do not consider anything as proof in the scientific literature if you see that it's disputed. And so there are papers where they're claiming that Neanderthals buried their dead, but you'll find five times as many papers disputing that claim. Likewise, you'll find papers that say Neanderthals had control over fire, but the number of papers refuting that are far more numerous than the papers that are claiming that. One of the more famous examples is they found this leg bone that had two holes in it, and one group of researchers says, this is a Neanderthal flute. They took a leg bone from an animal, punched a couple of holes in it, and that became a flute. But all they had was a piece of a, a leg bone, and they had two holes in it. There was nothing to show a mouth or a cap at either end. And then papers got published saying, those holes were actually drilled by a saber-toothed tiger. It had nothing to do with the Neanderthals at all. And there's no way, people tried to take that a uh, little piece of bone with the two holes in it and try to manufacture it to make a musical instrument, they couldn't do it. So this is now no longer considered. Again, advanced tools, use of symbols. A paper got published just a few months ago where they said, we finally found Neanderthals using symbols. What did they really find? They found a piece of stone with vertical scratches on it. 
and said, we think Neanderthals made those scratches and we think those four vertical scratches are a complex symbol, kind of like letters of our alphabet. But you know, I've been in Canada and I've seen rocks where you can see scratches down and it was made by a grizzly bear. So it's like four vertical scratches. And again, many more papers disputing that claim than papers claiming it. But just because a paper claims it doesn't mean it's true. And that piece of advice I can give to you, all the time I'm having to deal with people saying, I read this on the internet, and doesn't this overturn uh, the Christian faith? And it's like, well, if the internet article doesn't give you a link to a peer-reviewed paper, don't even bother reading it. You know, a credible paper will give you a URL link to the peer-reviewed paper, but don't stop there. Go to a site like PubMed. It's a government site where they archive all the life sciences papers. And so you can put in there uh, Neanderthal control of fire. A couple of hundred papers will pop up and that will give you very quickly a consensus whether this has any credibility in the scientific literature. Point is, never believe a single peer-reviewed paper. You actually want to read uh, all the papers that they're dealing with that subject. And that's not that hard to do. And the abstract of papers is always free to the public. That's the rule. You may have to pay money to read the paper, but you'll never have to pay money to read the abstract. And I'll give you an inside tip. You won't even have to pay to read the paper. If the paper made it through the peer review process, that means the preprint of the paper is credible. And the preprints are always free. There's a site called ARXIV where they archive all the preprints. And if the preprint never made it into a journal, don't give it any credibility. But if it did, and you don't want to fork over the $25 to buy the peer-reviewed paper, you can actually read the paper for free uh, by going to ARXIV. And my experience is if it's past peer review, uh, the preprint is not going to be a whole lot different uh, from the paper uh, in the journal. Okay, and for Neanderthals, no evidence they wore clothes, no evidence for technological advance. They did not make dwellings. There is one research paper where they claimed they went inside a cave and they found a Neanderthal building. What they actually found was a pile of rocks at the bottom of the cave, and they were presuming these rocks must be the damaged remains of a building that Neanderthal built. However, another group of scientists went into a different cave uh, where they found another pile of rocks and they said that pile uh, was a place where bears were dwelling. Uh, there's no evidence that Neanderthals or humans used that and the pile of rocks looks the same. Okay, no evidence they tamed animals, no evidence for capability. What about the brain comparisons? Okay, for humans, the cerebellum is larger on both hemispheres. And maybe you're not familiar with that term. Some of you have, uh, have taken anatomy courses, so you know all about this. But hey, let me give you this big globular part here, left hemisphere and right hemisphere, that's the cerebellum. as distinct from this little object down here at the bottom of the brain stem. So that's the cerebellum. And what we're saying is, uh, for the human cerebellum, uh, it's larger on both hemispheres, where in the case of Neanderthal, not only is the cerebellum smaller, the right side of the Neanderthal's cerebellum is smaller than the left side, whereas for humans, both sides are the same. The human brain is globular, the Neanderthal brain is elongated, the human parietal lobe is much, much larger, and the human neocortex is larger. And if you're not familiar with that term, the neocortex uh, refers, it's basically the outer part of the cerebellum. That's the neocortex. But for the human, it's much bigger than it is for the apes and for the bipedal primates that preceded us. And this is brand new in the scientific literature. Just the last six months, anthropologists have found a way to determine the population sizes of these bipedal primate species that preceded us, and they got the best data for the Neanderthals. If you're not familiar with the term Denisovans, there's a debate going on. Denisovans are recent bipedal primates 
that they have found in southern Siberia, basic around the Caspian Sea area. Uh, they have found, and they look a little bit different than Neanderthal, but there's a major debate going on. Many anthropologists believe that the Denisovans are Neanderthals. There's a slight difference, but given that they were geographically separated, we would expect that there would be a slight difference. But what's in the literature now is that the total population of Neanderthals and Denisovans together never exceeded 15,000 individuals at any time during the past 300,000 years. That was the maximum population level. And the effective population size never exceeded 5,000. What does effective population mean? That's the number of individuals that are capable of being able to produce, produce children. So it's basically the men and the women uh, that are of reproductive age. So that never exceeded 5,000. And the geographical range of the Neanderthals covered all of Europe, a little bit of North Africa, and a good chunk of southern Siberia. It adds up to a population density of 0.0005. Uh, per square mile, which is a firm fact that when we look at Neanderthal DNA, we see that they're highly inbred. With a population density that small, they would have to be highly inbred. But the real significance of these population levels, there's no way they're going to evolve with a population level that tiny. They're going to have a hard time just surviving from one generation to the next with a population level uh, that small and explains why we see no difference in the morphology of the earliest Neanderthals compared to the morphology of the latest ones. The skeletons of a quarter of a million years ago of Neanderthals are identical to the skeletons that date 45,000 years ago. And likewise, we see no difference in the DNA. All that's well explained by their tiny population sizes. And to give you a point of comparison, the lowest population density of any nation on the planet today is Mongolia. They have 5.4 individuals per square mile, which is about 10,000 times greater than the population density of the Neanderthals. And the latest papers are saying uh, that we see no difference in these population levels for Homo erectus, for the Heidelbergensis, the Australopithecines, I mean, you may have been taught about anthropology, about all these skeletal remains. Well, over the course of six and a half million years of a dozen different species of bipedal primates, the total amount of bones that they have found of these creatures uh, would easily fit inside this room. So you may get the idea that they have a huge amount of evidence. The fact is they have scant evidence. And only with the Neanderthals do we have complete skeletons. With all the other species, we've got parts of the skeleton. We don't have complete skeletons. But this raises a question. Uh, what's the purpose of God creating? And I'm saying God creating because with population levels at 8,000, 5,000, maximum 15,000, there's no possibility for evolution. It basically implies that each of these species was specially created. So it raises a question. I got this uh, question from atheist anthropologists. Why would your God bother to create all these bipedal primates, given that he wanted human beings? Why not just jump from the chimpanzee straight to the human beings? Well, the answer is God wanted to prepare large body bird and mammals for the arrival of the ultimate predator. If it wasn't for the bipedal primates, when we humans arrived on the scene, we would have quickly eliminated all the large body bird and mammal species that we need to sustain our civilization. You know, as I spoke a couple of nights ago at the church, uh, there are certain animals that are crucial for the launch of civilization. Where would we be if we had no horses, if we had no donkeys, if we had no turkeys, if we had no chickens, no pigs, no cows? We would have never gotten out of the Stone Age. And what we see in terms of uh, large mammal extinction rates, when humans entered Australia, within a few hundred years, they wiped out 94% of all the large mammal species that were there. Australia had camels. Australia had horses and cows. Uh, but when the humans arrived in Australia, 
they quickly wiped them out. And so what happened in Australia, the human population remained low. It remained constrained to a Stone Age technology until Europeans came and brought the animals that they needed. Same thing happened in South America and North America. The extinction rate wasn't as high, but was high enough to keep the population of humans on both continents at a low level, kept them at a Stone Age technology. In Europe, Asia, and in Africa, we see cities and civilization had access to the animals they needed. Sub-Sahara was exposed to all 12 species of known bipedal primates. The extinction rate was just 4.5%. There's a reason why people go to Africa on safaris, because they get to see all these big uh, mammalian species. Africa's got more of them than anywhere else. But even in Asia and Europe, enough survived that the launch of civilization was possible. <coughs> now, when my colleague Fazal Rana comes, he will tell you, and we look at that six and a half million years of 12 distinct species of bipedal primates, we see chaos from a naturalistic perspective. You would anticipate that if it's common descent by naturalistic means, we would see the brain size of these species gradually going up in a linear fashion. We don't see that. The brain size does this. It goes up and down. There's no progression, and the very latest bipedal primate that they found before human beings has a brain the size of a chimpanzee. It's actually the smallest of the brain sizes, the exact opposite of what you'd expect from a naturalistic perspective. Same thing with bipedal capability. Now, Neanderthals are highly bipedal, but if you look at all 12 species, you see the bipedalism also does this. It goes up and down. We don't see this progression up towards human beings. The only place where we do see progression is the capability of these species to hunt and kill large mammal uh, game. That does go up in a linear fashion. But that fits the fact that God would know we human beings would fall into sin, and in falling into sin, we would mismanage the resources of the planet, and we would wind up killing off the very animals that we need. And what we see, particularly in North America and South America, the first animals to be wiped out were the biggest ones, the mastodons, uh, which were the size of elephants. They were easy to kill, and hey, you kill one mastodon, you can feed 4,000 people for a couple of weeks. So it's an easy supply of food. And because humans are selfish, they simply say, let's get as much food as possible with as little effort as possible, and that is going after the big mammals. And so in North America, they killed off all the horses, they killed off all the camels, they killed off all the mastodons, they killed off all the big flightless birds, so all the easy game was gone, but now they didn't have the animals they needed to launch and sustain a civilization. Okay, in closing, what specifics does the Bible say about human origins? It basically says that when God created human beings, that was his final creation miracle. That's when he stopped creating. It's also explicit that the only spiritual beings that God created on earth were human beings, and that every human being alive today is descended from Adam and Eve. Now, I've debated the biologos over the past 15 years. We've actually written a book. Uh, it's, a, it's a debate book where biologos and reasons to believe debate one another in written form. Uh, we greatly disagree on the Bible and also on the science, uh, but I've been debating the executive director of Biologos several times in the past few years, uh, Deborah Harzma, and uh, it was Francis Collins, the founder of Biologos, who said, genetics proves we didn't come from two people. We came from 10,000. I'm a little bit older than uh, uh, Francis Collins, and I can remember in my teenage years reading the scientific literature where they said we were descended from a million people. The ancestral population of humans was one million. And I remember in my 20s, they dropped it to 100,000. Francis Collins came up with his book and he said 10,000. When my colleague Fazal Rana uh, debated Dennis Venema, 
uh, the geneticist that's part of BioLogos, uh, he was willing to come down to 1,200. In a follow-up debate, he came down to 800. The last time I debated Deborah Harzma, she said we can go down to 132. And so I said, Deborah, you're only 45. I'm quite a bit older than you. Let's plot a graph of where it's been going. 1 million, 100,000, 10,000, 1,200, 800, 132. Do you think it's heading down towards the biblical too? And we look at all these numbers. Aren't they all based on <coughs> uh, mathematical models that number one, presume common descent? They all assume that common descent is true. If that assumption is false, the numbers go out the window. And uh, number two, they're based on huge systematic errors. And so you might say 132, but the systematic error is basically plus or minus 1,000 individuals. So you really can't distinguish this from two. So that's kind of where the debate is going. But this is a debate that's filtered into churches all over America and Europe, where I now see pastors and theologians saying, we have to give up on the Adam and Eve idea. But giving up on Adam and Eve has consequences. Because after all, Paul addresses Adam in Romans chapter 5, all the way through chapter 8. And as I actually read this theological literature, they're now basically debating amongst one another. I think we overestimated the education and intellectual capability of the Apostle Paul. He really wasn't that smart. Look at all the mistakes he made. Uh, he actually thought that we were descended from just two people. Uh, but in one debate I had with the Biologo scholars, there was one individual that stood up and said, you know, we have to admit to all of you at reasons to believe the book of Romans is our biggest problem. It's not easy to toss out the big of book of Romans and retain the Christian faith. But the problem is they're presuming that that 10,000 individual figure or 1,200 individual figure is unassailable when it was never uh, appropriate in the first place. First time I met Francis Collins, he says, Hugh, you need to understand my genetics is as secure as the law of gravity. And my response to him is, well, on the law of gravity, we have statistical errors. We don't have systematic errors. When it comes to genetics, you've got relatively small statistical errors, but you've got enormous systematic errors, and you can't even be assured that you have actually identified all the systematic errors. So basically making a point, genetics is not like astrophysics. In fact, if you read the genetics literature, what you notice is they only use the statistical errors, the errors they made in measuring it. They do not address the systematics, which is an effect that actually shifts all the numbers, either up or down. And the systematics literally are as high as plus or minus 2,000%. Uh, whereas in the astrophysical uh, literature, you are identify the system and come up with measurements of the systematic errors. Again, when I talk with my friends of Biologos, I said, <coughs> excuse me, of course we don't publish the systematic errors. We don't even know what they are. Uh, but again, uh, read a paper if all you see are the statistical errors, uh, be careful. And particularly when they talk about, hey, this artifact is 45,000 years old. If there's no mention of the systematic errors, then it could be 45,000, uh, plus or minus 30,000. I'll give you a classic example. Uh, for a couple of decades, I was critiqued for stating that humans did not get into Australia uh, until about 30,000 years ago. And people kept throwing at me a research paper that said, here is proof from the Gymnian cave that Aborigines were in Australia 60,000 years ago. And I pointed out, well, the dating method is optical luminescence. Uh, you know, that has big systematics. I mean, if the sample got buried and cut off from sunlight, that's going to add a whole lot of extra years. Well, how that finally got settled, they found the same carbon material and found a way to carbon date it. And the date came in 3,000 years ago. It was literally off by a factor of 2,000%. Uh, okay, 
The date for human beings, 15,000 to 125,000 years ago. Carbon-14 uh, pushes that between 40 and 125,000 years ago. And the more we learn from the record of nature about anthropology, the more reasons we gain to believe we humans are God's special creation. We're all descended uh, from two individuals. And let me just make this one point. You know, when God created Eve, women, when they're born, have all their reproductive eggs intact. But Eve was specially created by God. And so God could have easily made all of her reproductive eggs genetically distinct. So with a, a woman today, her eggs have a lot of genetic similarity. But if Eve is a special creation of God, then he could easily have made her different, her reproductive eggs uh, genetically distinct, which means that there'd be no risk of propagating genetic defects within the first 20 or 30 generations. This is something you see in the book of Genesis. In Genesis, there's no prohibition against brother-sister marriages. There is in the book of Exodus, but up until Exodus, no prohibition. You probably recall that Abraham was married to his half-sister. And the reason why, completely safe. If Eve indeed had genetically distinct eggs, there's no risk with a brother marrying a sister. We had a major debate with the Biologos folks because they said, hey, if it's one man and one woman, somebody had to marry their sister. Somebody had to marry their brother. And we're saying, hey, if Eve has genetically distinct eggs, that's not a problem at all. It might be a problem for cousins in Kentucky to marry one another, but it wouldn't be a problem uh, for a son of Adam and Eve to marry a daughter of Adam and Eve. Uh, so maybe you're from Kentucky. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> okay. I'll take questions on any subject. This is the last lecture I'm giving you. Yes, go ahead. Uh, the, not all the animals. Not all the them. only animals where it uses the word bara is for birds and mammals. Okay. But, so we're talking uh, salamanders. That's an open question. It could be, but it doesn't have to be. If I'm not mistaken, does that mean, so humans, were they made from something else then? So they weren't made out of nothing. Okay. What you see with both humans and the birds and the mammals <coughs> is that Genesis 1 uses two verbs. Asa and bara. So it says of us humans that God made us and he created us, which basically is saying there's something about the human that's made from stuff that already existed, but there's something about the human that never existed before. That requires bara. Now, our physical bodies are not brand new. Other creatures have physical bodies, but the spirit within us is brand new that never existed before in any other creature. Likewise with the birds and mammals. Their bodies are not brand new. Physical bodies existed before, but their soulish features, mind, will, and emotions, their nurturing capability, their ability to relate to a higher species, that's brand new. So that's why you see the two verbs, asa, bara. What you see in Genesis 2 is the verb yatsar. And what's interesting about that Hebrew verb, it combines the meaning of both bara and asa. So there again, it's implying uh, that there's a component of humanity uh, that God miraculously made, but it's not brand new. But there's a component that really is brand new. And the word to make, it'd be similar to taking iron and aluminum and copper ore and uh, making an aircraft. I mean, it's just natural material that's being assembled, but you're going to need a mine to be able to figure out how to you know, take those raw uh, minerals and transform them into an aircraft you'd be willing to fly to the mainland on. Yeah, I get that all the time. <laughs> well, it tells us that no one can think or imagine how great and wonderful what we're going to be experiencing in the new creation, 1 Corinthians 2.9. 
All of us have had wonderful experiences with these soulish animals. I don't think God's going to take that away from us. If he is going to take it away from us, he's going to replace it with something far, far better. Now, what we see in Ecclesiastes is that humans live on beyond the grave. The animals return to the dust. So that seems to imply that your pet dog is not going to be with you in heaven. But it doesn't rule out the possibility that there will be dog-like creatures in heaven. There's a single sentence in Revelation 21, which basically says that in the new creation, God will be creating. He doesn't tell us what he'll be creating, but he says he'll be creating, and these creations will be kingdoms, and that we humans who have given our lives to Jesus Christ will be ruling over those kingdoms. But it's completely unspecific as to what God's going to create. But we're going to be magistrates over that. So that could easily include... Uh, animals, and keep in mind is going to be animals subject to different laws of physics, just like we'll be under different laws of physics. So any of the shortcomings you see in your pets, all that's going to be eliminated in the new creation. So if there are pets there, it's going to be really wonderful. And I think what God is going to create in the new creation, since we're going to be ruling over it, it's going to be something that'll be like the pets. In other words, we can tame them, uh, we can train them, uh, but in my opinion, is going to be way better than a pet we have heard. And I ran into one theologian who said, you know, I have such a great relationship with my dog, I can't understand why my dog wouldn't be with me in heaven, but cats, forget it. They're not going to be there. <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, what the Bible gives us is a rough date for when he created Adam and Eve. It doesn't mention any of the bipedal primates that preceded us. It doesn't mention dinosaurs. It doesn't mention Neanderthals. It doesn't mention Homo erectus for the simple reason the Bible is inspired for all generations. So it's not going to mention species of life that only we today know that they existed. So it doesn't give us a date for when those creatures existed. Scientifically, we can come up with dates, uh, but from a biblical perspective, we can't. Just like the Bible doesn't give us a date for the Neanderthals. From a scientific perspective, we can. And the Bible explicitly tells us we can trust the scientific record. Yes? Um, so you said Adam was given the, the duty to name all the Nefesh animals. Right? Yes. Um, do you think we still use those names today, or have they kind of changed over time in the culture? I think they changed for the simple reason Genesis chapter 11 says that God took the one language of humanity and made it multiple languages. So yeah, different names. And yeah, every nation you go to, every language you go to, they have a different name for all the different creatures. They have different sound effects. Pardon me? They have different sound effects. Different sound effects, yes. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. So I have a few questions, but um, in what ways would you say that humans were created in God's image? Okay, we're created in God's image in that God has a spirit. Um, and we are able to create like God creates. So, and there's a major debate amongst theologians. How far can we push this image of God? Because after all, it tells us in Hebrews, the only one who has the exact image of God is Jesus Christ. The angels don't have the exact image of God. By the way, the Bible never says the angels possess the image of God. It only says that of us human beings. Now, it does say that angels take the title sons of God. So people have said, well, maybe that is somewhat equivalent to the image of God. But explicitly, only humans take that title. And again, it's a major debate. You don't see the word image of God very often in scripture. Yeah. So, but it's basically saying we're definitely more similar to God uh, than the chimpanzees are. Yeah. So what's different between, I mean, I know there's differences, but how are humans more similar to the image of God than angels are? 
Well, that's a major debate amongst theologians. But the Bible doesn't tell us a whole lot about angels. It does say that the angels are definitely more powerful than us. Uh, they live in a different dimensional realm. They can come into our realm. They can leave our realm. We humans don't have that capability. We're constrained to the space-time dimensions of the universe. So we're not as powerful as the angels. And uh, the angels are not capable of experiencing death. We are. Uh, but because we are, we have a pathway to redemption, whereas the fallen angels do not. So in that sense, when God cut off access to the tree of life, it was a gift for us human beings. If he'd allowed us to take up the tree of life, we'd be in the same miserable spot as the fallen angels. But thanks to physical death, there's a pathway whereby we can be redeemed from spiritual death. Well, Paul makes the point, and you see this in the book of Hebrews as well, right now we're lower than the angels, but a time will come when we'll be above the angels, we'll be ruling over them, we'll be judging them, we'll be teaching them. Why? Because unlike the angels, we directly experience the grace of God. They observe the grace of God, we get to directly experience it. And it's kind of like what you do here in this class. Your direct experience means that you're more capable of uh, managing that subject material than if you just observe someone going through the class. Going through it yourself makes a big difference. It also tells us in the Bible that the good, the righteous angels are intently observing us to try to learn the mystery of God's grace. For them, it's incomprehensible why this God would bestow favor upon these sinful human beings. What is God up to? We have greater understanding because we actually get to experience the benefit of God's grace. The angels are content to just watch it. And, but it says they're very much fascinated by this. So they're intently observing us. That's why Paul says, realize in your life here on earth, you are on stage. You're being observed. You don't have private moments. You're being observed by the dead in Christ. You're being observed by the righteous angels. And as far as that goes, the wicked angels are looking for an advantage to try to defeat you. So it says, we do not wrestle just against flesh and blood. And incidentally, that, in my opinion, explains why it's in church you see people holding such irrational positions. You don't see it outside the church, you see it inside the church. But it makes perfect sense. Where is Satan going to fight his battles? Outside the church or inside the church? So when you read church history and see all the weird things that Christians have fought over, the weird and how that doesn't happen outside the church, that's the battleground. There's a reason. Satan has a mission. Yes? Um, so you were saying God cut us off from the tree of life. Um, and it sounded like you were saying that if we would have eaten from the tree of life, we would have lived eternally as sinners. Yes, yes. Um, how does that work if the laws of physics don't change? Well, our access to the tree of life meant that we could be delivered from the consequences of the second law of thermodynamics. I mean, the laws of physics guarantee our physical bodies will decay. And so, as it says in the book of Revelation, the tree of life is for the healing of the nations, which means we can go there, and it's like the balm of Gilead, it basically reverses the effect of the second law of thermodynamics. By being cut off from the tree of life, basically thermodynamics runs its course. Uh, our bodies will decay, they will burn out. What happens to your automobile? Leave it in your backyard uh, and don't give it any attention, it will rust away. Yes? How do you feel about uh, spiritual warfare? Spiritual warfare? Well, I think you're on to something. In the United States, I see Christians claiming angelic activity, or in my opinion, it doesn't exist. Where you are going to see angelic activity is where you're on Satan's turf. 
I mean, if you're in places where a quarter of the population is demon-possessed, don't be surprised if you see a battle between the righteous angels and the evil angels. Don't be surprised if you see God performing miracles to overthrow the power of the evil one and his demons. But if the demons are not active, I don't think you're going to see that happening. As I mentioned yesterday, in terms of the spiritual gifting, the gifts you see in 1 Corinthians 12 are supernatural assists for us who are believers in Jesus Christ to help us overcome the supernatural barriers to the spreading of the gospel. But in my own personal experience, the only time I've seen this in action is where there's supernatural barriers to the spreading of the gospel. If the barriers aren't there, I don't see those gifts operating. Other <coughs> gifts operate, but not those gifts. And yeah, I've personally seen this myself. Uh, I've made uh, trips to uh, Soviet Russia when the communists were still in control, uh, where the major universities actually had departments of all called physics. And so a huge number of the physics professors wound up being demon-possessed. And so I was speaking to audiences where anywhere from 20 to 30 percent of the people in the audience were demon-possessed. And what I noticed too, those that weren't, they all believed in demons. They saw them every day. They knew exactly what was going on. However, they felt that these demons were more, more powerful than God. And you know, I can remember one lecture I gave the individuals are demon-possessed, screamed at the top of their lungs, accusing Jesus of all kinds of really vile uh, moral uh, impurity, uh, you know, rape and uh, just horrible things. Um, and screaming at the top of their lungs, I wasn't even able to get my lecture out. And so I just said to the others, hey, let's just go into a different room uh, where we can have a Q&A session. But I said, I'm going to come back. I came back with another American Christian and I said, I just want you to sit at the back and pray that the demons will be silent. And it worked. They were totally silent. Everybody was stunned. They said, these guys have never been quiet. Uh, what, how, how did the demons get shut up? And consequently, a huge number of them came to faith in Christ. So. What God's committed to do is to demonstrate he's more powerful than the demons. But if the demons aren't there, there's no need for that. Yes? There's spiritual warfare everywhere. I mean, you know, where I think we in America can really see the spiritual warfare, go to the internet and see how much of the internet is dedicated to pornography and how many people are watching that pornography, the number of hours. It's unbelievable. And so, yeah, I think Satan and his demons are doing everything they can to try to poison the mind of Christians and non-Christians alike. So, and that's what Paul said, we don't wrestle just with flesh and blood. So don't be surprised when you see people trapped in uh, you know, serious moral issues. Uh, there's a war going on and uh, don't be surprised if you see really weird things going on, there's a war going on. And this is why he said, you need to pray. I can say one thing about prayer. Prayer is the only tool that God has given us where he's put restrictions on how to use it. The reason he's put restrictions on how we're to pray is because it's such a very powerful tool. So he's basically telling us, be careful how you pray. But he's also exhorting us, please pray. God has made a commitment to partner with us in prayer. And when you pray, he transforms you. Part of your character building only takes place through prayer. And so if you don't pray, God's going to find someone else to partner with. And the Bible tells us we need to be praying one-on-one -on -one with God. We also need to be praying in groups. We need to be praying on a regular basis. But I also firmly believe we need, at least on occasion, to be praying and fasting. And fasting isn't always dealing without food, but you sacrifice something. Paul, for example, would fast from sleep. Instead of sleeping that night, he would pray all night. We can fast from food. You can fast from smartphones. I mean, there's all kinds of ways you can fast. The principle of fasting, put away something that's distracting you so you can focus more intently on the most powerful tool and most powerful weapon that God has placed in your hands. I'll give you one example.
This happened a few decades ago in our church. And uh, in Pasadena, they opened up this bookstore. It was a pornographic bookstore, and it wasn't long before prostitutes came and Johns came. And so I gathered a group of young singles. They were all about your age. And I said, I want you to come over to our apartment. We're going to pray and fast for 24 hours. And this is what we're going to do. We're going to pray that God will intervene and shut down the bookstore. If that doesn't happen, uh, we're going to actually go and pray in front of that bookstore. And if that doesn't stop it, we're going to go there a third day of prayer and fasting, and we're going to talk to the Johns and the prostitutes. Now, you can imagine we started that first day of prayer and fasting. A lot of the people that were with me saying, I'm not sure I'm committed to go that far. I'm okay praying and fasting in your apartment, but going out in front there and actually going talking to the prostitutes and Johns, I'm out. I said, no, let's at least spend the day together praying and fasting. At the end of that 24 hours, the 20 people that were with me there all committed themselves to go the whole way. And we're going to go, we're going to commit to three consecutive days of prayer and fasting, each a week apart. And the final day, we're actually going to go and talk to the prostitutes and Johns. What happened was, six days later, the bookstore was gone. We didn't have to go in front there and pray and fast. We didn't have to talk to the Johns and prostitutes. But I think God wanted to see, are you really committed to go the whole way? And so it took that first day. I can tell you, it took until hour 22 before everybody said, we're going to go the whole way. And in our church, I've never seen that kind of commitment to ministry without fasting. So pray and fast. At Reasons to Believe, we have three days of prayer and fasting every year. And I think that is the growth of our ministry. Okay, this is going to be the last question because I think we're at past dinner time. What, what are we to be? Well, you'll see this in First John, where he says, we are to pray for people to repent and come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, but there's certain people we're not to pray for. We're not to pray for the reprobates. Okay, the term reprobate is referring to a human being that's incapable of repenting, incapable of forgiving, they're incapable of thinking any good thought. They're incapable of doing any good deed. All they're capable of doing 100% of the time is evil. These are individuals who've committed blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And so John tells us we're not to pray for those individuals. Okay. We're not to talk to them either. Because, and I've actually done this and suffered the consequences. Uh, they'll go after you. They'll attack you. They'll hurt you. Uh, and they're going to spread all kinds of rumors about you. So basically what we're being told in the Bible, these people are dangerous. They're cancerous. What you see in Romans 1 verse 32, people who are on the path to reprobation where they become reprobate, they become malignant. And what he means by that is they're not only content to do evil, they're in a mission to get as many other people as possible to practice evil with them. And they're committed to be evangelists for evil. And so the Bible is basically telling us we're not to pray for those people. We're not to try to talk to them. They're dangerous. Now, that's one reason why the Bible has given us 57 distinct characteristics of the reprobate. Because, you know, when I've done marriage counseling in our church, I often will get a woman that says, you know what, I need to divorce my husband, he's a reprobate. And I said, well, let me talk to him first. And I talk to him and discover he's nowhere close to being a reprobate. When I go down the 57 characteristics, he doesn't have a single one of them. But that's the problem. I mean, we're, we, we are emotional beings, we're subjective. And so scripture again tells us, don't write somebody off until you know it's confirmed they're in that category. So, and we're not to pray for our own selfish needs. So, 
And moreover, I was sharing with somebody yesterday, hey, when you're praying for your parents, I mean, I was the first one to come to Christ in my family. It took my parents another 30 years before they became a Christian. And, uh, you know, I began my prayer saying, Lord, I want my parents to become Christians. And after a while, I heard God's rebuke. I already know that. Tell me how you want them to become Christians. He wanted me to pray specifically. So that's something else about prayer. It's not to be general. It's not to be repetitious. You know what Jesus said? No repetitious prayers like the Pharisees. And so we can pray beginning generally, but then God wants us to get more and more specific. He's basically saying, yeah, I know what you want me to do. Tell me step by step, how do you want to do it? And what I realized in the case of my mother, if she had come to Christ when I wanted her to come to Christ, her five nursing friends wouldn't have come to Christ. It was critical for them to come to Christ first and last of all my mother. So I had too short of a view of what God wanted to do. He says, I don't just want to save your mother. I got more people in mind and I'm going to use your mother in a very special way to bring those ladies to Christ. So, and then there was a sixth nurse that my mother knew. She led that nurse to Christ on her deathbed. So, hey, I don't think that would have happened if my mother had become a Christian 20 years earlier. So, one of the books I hope to write is a book on prayer. But uh, my whole point is, it's an incredibly powerful tool, and because of its power, God has got a, given us a lot of instructions how to use it and how not to use it. Okay, I'm going to dismiss all of you because I think you're past your dinner time. It's been a pleasure teaching you. Thank really you. enjoyed this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.